Hello, everybody. We are going to talk a bit about observability and performance with services, right? My name is Antonio Gea. I work for Google Star Software Engineer and Cinegur TL, and some of you know me from working in kind with Ben the Elder. Yeah, my name is Nadia Pinaeva. I'm a senior software engineer at Red Hat. Okay, so I'm not going to explain much. Everybody here knows what services, but the important thing of services, I, I, I want to call them as the magic that connects all the application, right? You do QCTL apply, and a lot of pods start to be created, a lot of applications start to be created, and they somehow are able to communicate with them. But I spend a lot of time with users, customers, debugging problems, and they resolve with this question. Oh, my performance is not good, but what, what do you mean by performance, right? This is a, a complex topic. How do you describe performance? For everybody, it's something different. So when I started commenting this with Nadia, we started to say, okay, we need to do something, right? Let's try to, to find a methodology or some common language so we can standardize what means performance on services. But before going into that, let's, let's be realistic. We, are, we need to follow the, 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 the rules of, of the, we, we cannot go faster than the speed of light, right? For the people that is familiar with this RFC, the 1925, this is from 1996, and it still applies. So let's try to understand in, in our context on the networking performance in Kubernetes, what means the speed of light, okay? Let's try to, to simplify the problem to the most, the most common stack. If you see in most of the clusters today, you have a pod that has a network interface, and the network interface connects to the kernel, and the kernel delivers this to another network interface. So if we want to understand the pod-to-pod -pod communication, you can see that the pods send the packet through the different stages and the, the, the packet starts to go through all the kernel hooks and all, uh, perform all these operations. So our performance is going to be the size of the packet divided by the time that the packet takes to get to the other part, right? Simple. And then what happens with services? Services is, uh, we're talking about L4 services, right? So what services are going to do is we are going to implement services doing that. Typically, you implement doing that, right? Let's focus on the most common implementation. And let's focus on the standard implementation, that's the one of QProxy. How Q, QProxy implements services is about doing the NAT, right? So the packet will go out to the pod, do his way, and will reach the DNAT stage in the pre-routing hook. There, the QProxy implementation using the technology they want is going to switch the destination IP, that is going to be the cluster IP, for the IP of the pod. So the performance in services is going to be always maximum the pod to pod performance minus the time that these operations in the deny hook are going to happen, right? But you can say, okay, but now we have EBPF. EBPF is faster. Okay, let's take a look to the EBPF implementation, the most common implementation of EBPF for services, right? What EBPF does is it performs the same operation of implementing DNAT but in the QD's ingress traffic control hook, right? So if we see at the diagram, in the most common of the cases, the, the life of the packet is going to be the same. So the difference in performance between the implementation with QProxy and other EBPF implementation is going to be the time of perform this operation for NAT in the DNAT hook or in the ingress hook. But we always hear about this. Is we have this thing of accelerated or uh, improved performance thing, and that's right, because we can take shortcuts. I mean, performance, we know we cannot go beyond the speed of light, but at the end of the day, our speed of light is limited by the number of operations that the kernel to, to needs to do in the packet. So if we shortcut this number of operations, or we offload this number of operations, we are able to have what we call a fast path, right? We know here that we need to go to the other pod. We just avoid to go through the kernel. We can do this with eBPF. We can do this with NS tables. I have a pull request in QProxy that implement this. So this is an improvement of performance, right? So 
far so good. We know, okay, we know more or less how service performance works for one packet, for one service, but this is not our reality, right? We have clusters, and the cluster has nodes, and the example that I was putting, it was two pods in the same node. What happens when you have something in the middle like this cloud? Who, what is the performance of this cloud? Is consistent, is not consistent, and then, how do I measure this? Okay, I can start to put some metrics in some place, some metrics in other place, and then people start to deploy ingress, more pods, services, whatever, and you have, I mean, I don't know the performance. What is the performance here? Because I cannot have all the connections and all the things in my cluster reporting metrics and an analyzing one by one. So the, the proposal we have, and it's a methodology that I was using for a long time, and Nadia and I, working with the tooling and that you're going to present the results of this methodology is let's focus on what performance means to me, what the performance of the application is, right? Instead of measuring all this connection, uh, all these technical metrics, let's get metrics from that are uh, influencing the user experience. And we ended with these four SLI, right? One is the programming latency. The programming latency is, since you do QCTL apply, the object service is created to the time that the data plan implement these, these rules. This is especially important if you have a application that needs fast startup or fast file over, right? You need then these rules to be applied quickly. Another SLI that we define is the first packing latency. That's we can say responsiveness, right? If you want your application to connect to the other application and come back quickly, right? If, this, if you have interactive application, or this is super important. Another important metric that is more tricky to understand, that we will go through it later, is the connection total latency. This is tricky because one thing is all the, not all the connections are the same. So if you have long connections, your latency is going to be very large compared if you have a small connections, but that's not necessarily bad. And the last SLI that we consider important is throughput. This is very well known uh, SLI, and it's very important if you have heavy data application, right? Storage, AI, checkpoints, databases. This, this, if you know, if your throughput is not good, this application is going to suffer. So, what this SLI allows us is to move to a more uh, user-facing uh, metrics that we understand because we know how they impact our application. That doesn't mean that we don't need to do custom benchmark, right? We, if we know the problem, where the problem is, we can perform this synthetic benchmark and that are very useful to understand this, um, how can I say? In, in a control scenario. But the problem is that we need to know when this is happening in production. This is what we want, right? This is when it's impacting us, because it's, it's happening in production and we cannot reproduce in a control scenario, we still have the problem and no solution. So, so far, this was the introduction, the technical introduction, and Nadia did a great job, created a tool, applied this methodology, and she's going to tell us all the results of this work. All right, so let's take a look at how we can use that. And we are gonna look at this user-driven performance validation. As Antonio said, it is kind of as opposed to some synthetic benchmarking scenario that you could have. So how could we do that, right? One way is to instrument the network so that not your applications or a benchmarking client will report to you actually what is going on in the network, but you want the network to tell you what's happening. And in this, in this case, you can run whichever applications you want in your cluster. So how can you do that? The way we went with is using contract events. So contract is this orange box that you can see twice inside the kernel. And the good side about that is that many different data planes will go through the box. So this method works for many different things like IP tables, NF tables, even OVS, CBPF. Many things will still end up using it in the end. And contract is nice because it generates events for every single connection in the cluster. Let's see what we can find there. Okay, first of all, there is a start time, which is the time when the first packet was seen. And if you're familiar with the contract, there is this scene reply stage, which means the first, the first packet in the opposite direction was seen. So how quickly you receive the reply. If you just use these two metrics, you can evaluate this first packet latency, which is the one of the SLIs Antonio mentioned before. 
Okay, next one for TCP connections, contract can actually track different stages of it, and the important one that we will use is TCP fin. So that is the stage when the connection is being closed. It means every th all the data was already sent, mm -hmm. and we are finishing this connection. So if you also use the start timestamp and this TCP fin time, you can evaluate the total connection latency. And the last one uh, is the counter of the number of bytes and packets that are being sent in each direction. And using that and the total connection latency, you can evaluate the throughput. So it's not exactly the kind of throughput as IPERF would report to you, so it will not tell you per second, per minute, but on average, during like the connection time, you know how many packets were sent, so you can evaluate the average throughput using that. Okay, so how do you do that? You can listen to contract events via Netlink socket, so then you can aggregate these events, report all the timestamps, evaluate the SLIs as I've just explained, and then expose this matrix to Prometheus Grafana dashboard and have a nice visualization. So there is an app up under this QR code that actually does that, and it is really simple to apply to your cluster. It has like a Damien set that can be created. It has all the Prometheus Grafana dashboards, everything that you can see, and even more on this slide. Okay, let's see how we can use that. So first of all, l does it actually even work, right? So I'm used, let's say I'm used to running my benchmarks. I have my application, Apache Benchmark is the one we are gonna be using because it's kind of popular. Um, so how does it compare, right? So let's run just like the first test, which is fairly simple. So we just create 10,000 services, a couple of backends, and then we run a couple of client pods that will generate thousands of connections. And we'll see what it will show us. So here we'll have two types of metrics. One is as reported by client, so Apache Benchmark. And this is the diagram. Let's take a closer look at it because we're gonna see a couple more of those. Um, so this is the client metrics. To be more precise, it's connection time, or it's like a version of Apache Benchmark of this first packet round trip time. It is reported in milliseconds. And what I'm showing here is the quantiles because we generate thousands of connections and we cannot look at each one of them, so we need to aggregate this data somehow, right? And the quantiles, I hope it's like a familiar concept to you, like for example, 0 0.5 means that the median value for connection latency was 10 milliseconds as reported by Apache Benchmark here. Okay, now let's see what the network tells us. Uh, the, in the networking metrics, we're using this contract tool that I've just mentioned, and um, this, it's analog of round trip time for the first packet is the scene reply metric. You can see that the absolute value is much less than what is reported by the client. So the client says average is 10 millisecond, while the network says that average is actually less than one millisecond. And it kind of makes sense because whatever client reports to you depends on this benchmarking app performance, when it sees the reply, how it actually timestamps that, right? And so many other different things. Okay, so that was a really quick network. Uh, the delay is less than one millisecond, super fast, because it's actually a kind cluster, one node, so all pods are on the same node, makes sense. But usually, the delay in the network is somewhat bigger, right? Can I emulate that? Yeah, so I can add an output delay to the server pod of three milliseconds. What that means is before sending a reply, the server will wait for three milliseconds, and only then the packet will be sent. All right, so let's see what the client tells us after that. You can see there are two measurements. The first one, the blue one, is no delay, and the red one is added three millisecond of delay. And the client actually thinks that the second one is faster. Not much, but a little bit. And this precision is also very limited because it only reports in milliseconds, so it doesn't know anything about that. And it also could be explained, I'm not an Apache benchmark expert, uh, but could be explained with this extra delay that it, the time it actually takes for the client to record the metrics. And if we look at what the network says, you can actually figure out what happened to the network by looking at this metric. So you can very clearly see in this comparison, the blue one is like almost invisible at this point, but you can clearly see that the three millisecond delay was added here. Which leads us to one of the outcomes that every benchmarking or measuring tool has its limitations and you need to understand it really well before actually using the results for something. Okay, so the tool is nice, it works, let's see what we can do with that. As members of SIG Network, 
the original goal we actually had is um, comparing this new mode of Q-proxy using NF tables versus IP tables. For those of you who may not know, uh, Q-proxy, first of all, it implements services in Kubernetes. And then the default mode for it was using IP tables before, but now we are switching to its successor, NF tables, which is supposed to be faster, better, and we like it more. So if you want to know more about this um, change, please join this talk tomorrow. Uh, you can hopefully scan the QR code while we are here. Um, and then Casey and Dan will be talking more about why that happened and how it actually went. But getting back to our performance, what we want to know is, for, we want to make sure that the new mode of QProxy performs better or at least not worse than the previous right? one. We don't want to release a new default version that is actually worse than the old one. So we wanted to double check that, right? And here is the first benchmarking that was actually done by Antonio. You can also find it on GitHub. It's all recorded, which is really nice because you can double check that. Um, and the theory was that IP tables performance should be worse than NF tables for two main reasons. One is the programming latency. So once again, it's the time that it takes for QProxy to make sure all the services are actually translated into the network and they work. And the second one is the latency of the first packet. So this round trip time of the first packet is supposed to be worse for IP tables because there is this linear surge that we'll talk about more in a minute. Okay, to check our theory, we need to generate some workload that will actually make sure that that's the case, right? So what can we do? Let's create a one service that has lots and lots of endpoints, 1,000K endpoints, 100K endpoints. Um, and we'll measure the time to program the data plane. So that's how we'll see the programming latency. And then the second one, we'll create one more service, service B, that will have a real server backend, and then we'll send the connection to that. And that is how we're supposed to check the latency on the first packet. So the idea here, for this latency part is that in IP tables, this is how this linear search is supposed to happen. So to find the backend for service B, we expect IP tables to look through all 100K backends for service A first, and only then come to the service B backend. Okay, so we run exactly this, we get the results. The conclusion is we're also using Apache Benchmark as a client to just generate the workload and see how the connection goes. And it actually times out with IP tables while it works with NF tables. So NF tables wins everything as we expect. And we come to this conclusion that QProxy NF tables seems to solve all our problems. Right. But if you take a second look, <laughs> that is not exactly what happens. So let's go with the first stressing the linear search one. That is not exactly how the search works. So if you look at the implementation, actually every service has its own little chain that contains all the backends of it. So when you go and try to ping service B, you will not actually look through all the 100K backends of service A. So all you will look through is just two services, which is actually fast and doesn't stress the linear search. So what it brings us to is designing the test workload is hard. You need to really, really understand what's happening and this is the note from Antonio. Think about your workloads and stress your cluster with that instead of copy pasting from internet. Especially copy pasting from my guest. <laughs> um, right, but, okay, we remember we had the client, right? Apache Benchmark it timed out with IP tables but didn't with NF tables. Uh, why is that? Let's take a look at some metrics. We report metrics, right? We should use them. Okay. So this one is the total number of IP tables rules that are created. You'll see, you create this huge service with 100K connections. The number of rules goes up and stays there, right? Looks like everything is configured immediately, everything is fine. Let's look at another one. So this one is actually the programming latency of QProxy. What you'll see here is worst case, two seconds. Not too bad, also fast enough, everything should be fine. That is until you actually take a look at the CPU usage metric that will actually kind of explain what is happening. So you can see here when this huge service is created, the CPU usage goes up 100% and then it stays like that for 20 minutes. <laughs> if you're patient enough, you'll wait till it actually goes down, 
which is where the configuration was actually finished. But then why these two previous metrics were reported that? That's how QProxy works, right? There is one large transaction that actually takes 20 minutes. And this metric is reported right before this transaction starts. And this one report is reported right after the transaction is done. So you will only see this infinity value after 20 minutes when the transaction is done. And then for this 20 minutes of while the transaction is going, you will have zero idea that something is wrong. Okay, so now we've, what we've actually figured out with that case is that the configuration time or programming latency for one service with 100K endpoints, for NF tables a bit more than a minute, for IP tables around 20 minutes. Okay, so what if we run Apache Benchmark now when IP tables actually finish doing its, its thing? The result will be the same as with NF tables because we didn't stress the linear search, if you remember. And the outcome of that is that confirmation bias is real. So when you have some theory or you have some expected result, as soon as you actually get it, you're happy to accept that this, everything is done, it works exactly as you expect, and you can go home. Okay, now we figured out what was wrong, let's try that again. So the first metric we'll try to stress is this first packet latency. Now we know that what actually stresses that is the amount of services, not the amount of endpoints. So we'll run the test, with variable amount of services and see what we get. Okay, which queue proxy do you think will program this faster? Who thinks that's gonna be NF tables? IP tables? Correct. Even though if you remember, IP tables performance was much worse on the previous case, in this case it's actually the opposite, so do not overgeneralize. If it programs one workload faster, doesn't mean it programs everything faster. Okay, so when of tables is worse, what exactly happens there? If you run 30,000 services, it just will never converge at all. And the reason for that is that IP tables has this really nice mode that is called partial sync. So it only applies on a per service basis, and then when the service itself doesn't change, it will only apply the new changes. While end of tables every time reconciles everything that it has. So what should we do? Well, we have to fix it for NF tables, and there is the pull request that actually does that. And some of the results for that is NF with NF tables, when you create 10,000 services, before it took 25 minutes, and after this improvement, it takes only nine minutes. And one other interesting thing that you may not think about is when you just add one extra service, so now you have 10,000 and one service, how much time it takes to apply this extra change. So before it took eight minutes, and after that it takes 140 milliseconds. Which also brings us to this outcome that our SLI-driven performance testing actually makes software better in the end. Okay, so we fixed enough tables, at least we can run our tests finally, right? So let's see which results we will get. If you think we're close to the end, we are not quite yet. So this network metrics for scene reply. We run IP tables, we increase the amount of services. What we expect to see, the more services we have, the worse the latency is, right? If you look at this diagram, you will actually see the opposite, which doesn't make any sense. And then you will go and try to figure out what this like contract start timestamp actually does. And it will take you some time probably, but then you can find in the the only place where I could find that is in the comment of the patch that actually introduced the timestamp, and it will tell you that this timestamp is done once the contract entry has been confirmed. So if you can see there are two contract squares on this, on this picture, and what you expect to happen probably is for it to happen in the first place or as soon as it's seen. But what is actually happening is it is timestamped on this second, in the second uh, contract square. And what it means is it actually does not reflect the whole time it took for the service to be implemented. Okay, kernel problem. So what you do when you see that, uh, you go and find some kernel friend. For me, that was Florian Westphal. Thanks a lot for he, to him for this patch that you can also find um, via this QR code. So what we've done is that uh, we have introduced timestamps for all contract events, which means that now you can know when everything happened in contract with kernel precision, which is really good. Okay, and then if you patch your kernel, disclaimer, all the other results are 
uh, obtained with the patched kernel, this is finally the result that you, can't, you can't expect to see. So we increase the amount of services for IP tables, and the, re the delay for the first packet also grows. So you can actually see this linear growth here finally. And then if you do the same for NF tables mode, you will see that it actually stays kind of stable no matter how many services you have, which is also kind of expected, and that's what we wanted to confirm. Now, if we bring them both to the same diagram, this is how it looks like. So you can see that NF tables not only stay stable with the amount of services, but it is also better performance in almost every case than IP tables, which is nice. But here you can ask me, okay, now isn't that confirmation bias you were talking about? You've just got the results that you wanted and happy with that? If you can double check something, always do that. Remember, we have this client-side metrics that Apache Benchmark is running this whole time and reports its own metrics. So while absolute value is very different, as you can see here on the right, you can see the metrics reported by Apache Benchmark, which goes up to 50 milliseconds, which is not exactly the case, but the pattern is really similar. So if you take a look at also, the client also shows that the latency actually grows for IP tables with the amount of services, and then if table stays kind of stable. Okay, so second SLI, if you still remember, we had uh, more than one, is the connection time. So for this, again, Apache Benchmark generated connections, they are very short. They just connect, send one request, get one reply, done. And this, for such short connections, you can see that the whole, du the whole duration of a connection is actually pretty much affected by this first packet delay. So that is kind of what you can see here. All right, getting to the next one, throughput. We need a different type of workload to test throughput, obviously. So what we'll do is we use iPer server as a backend, and then we'll create 10 clients that will all run one connection. And then, again, the same variables will check how it works with different amount of services. OK, this one is quick. No surprises after we figured out all the previous ones. Uh, the throughput is actually, for large connections, sending a lot of data is almost the same for all test cases, no matter what backend you're using. So this is the part when the new IQ proxy performs at least not worse. Okay, one more thing you may want to be interested in for your cluster around throughput is throughput fairness. So the network in the cluster is a shared resource. And when you have multiple connections, you want this resource to be distributed fairly. Now, you can see here there is one extra test at the very bottom, and you can see that the value that is reported for this test is actually the throughput is much smaller for the first and tenth quantiles. That is because I tweaked something in the network, or in the test case, I would say. You can take a second to think what that could be, because that's how we expect the metrics to use, right? We want to see the metrics and figure out what that means for our network. And this is the result you'll get with like unfair bandwidth distribution. So what I've done is one client out of 10 gets a bandwidth limit. So it cannot send as much data as all the other ones. And then if you just get all the results for 10 connections, this is kind of what you'll see. So the first one is really small and then everything else is around two gigabytes per second and is very stable. So this is exactly what you see on this previous distribution quantile. So you can see that something is not fairly distributed in your network. Okay, after all this test, what we can actually conclude that NF tables Qproxy has indeed better performance SLIs than IP tables for everything that we've tested. There is a little disclaimer there is a little case, at least that I already know about, that may not work better for NF tables yet, but we'll fix that in the future. Oh, you have yeah. So just to wrap up, <laughs> where, 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 what we do here is, as Sig Network uh, Kubernetes project, we are really worried about user, right? We develop uh, some implementation of services, and we focus on, on user-facing metrics. We are standardizing these metrics so all of you can run in your clusters in production. And we want to hear more about you. We are not focusing on technology. We use these metrics. Nadia created a reference implementation of these metrics, and she found one or two bugs in the kernel, two or three bugs in QProxy. So 
this is clear that this metrics works. And now, and every project can implement this metric. So, uh, as I say, run these metrics are very simple, and if you have any problems, come to Sync Network or open issues in GitHub and let us know, right? Because we are interested that in a standardized this, this way of measuring performance across the ecosystem. And that's all. Thank you for coming. Okay, we have around five more minutes for questions, if you have any. <laughs> is what is the test case that you know of already that's a little slow? I have to know. You just piqued my curiosity. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, so this one is actually what happens on uh, QProxy pod restart. Mm. So when you restart the pod, it has to like reconcile everything that it has. And also, end of tables doesn't do as well yet. And there was actually, there is already a fixed kernel bug for that because apparently end of tables was not really optimal in like reconciling all the rules at the same time which I ha don't have the scale test results for yet. So I cannot tell you how much better it is now. And there is also, of course, something that you can improve in QProxy code itself to also make this case works, work better. But doesn't mean there are no more cases that work worse. Cannot, cannot promise. <laughs> yes, yeah, sure. Want to use the mic? You have a mic. You have a mic behind you. Oh, on, the, on the corridor. Yeah. The difference actually is uh, right now between QPro, uh, between uh, NFT and uh, the regular one. Like you, s there is a bug, right? It's gonna be fixed. Oh, you mean this restart case? Yeah. Oh, I knew people will stick to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? I can I cannot actually I cannot give you the numbers now because it was quite some time since I've checked that. It also depends on the workload, right? How many services, how many backends each service has, like this will vary, but the difference was kind of bad. So worth fixing, let's say. Uh, we're talking here about mega services, uh, mega endpoints, right? This, this is not ordinary, this is a very string case, right? 10K services is very weird. I only see a few cases in production of this. 